speaker today is James Love. He's the director of Knowledge Ecology International. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this this on? Is, no. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I'd like to thank uh, Michael Shapiro for the U.S. delegation for being here. I'm not sure how many government delegates are here. I see my government's here. I'm <laughs> glad, glad about that. Um, the, I don't think the U.S. Oh, they are. Someone's going to be here. So, who's here from the EU? Delphine was here. She was also around. Oh, was all right. She okay. All right, okay. Um, yes, well, um, I'm just going to. I just review I, 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 I briefly just a couple key things in terms of the status of this. I mean, I, as we mentioned before, I think it, it, it's important to remember that uh, some of the things that have happened uh, before we got to Marrakesh, uh, uh, deaf people were put on a separate track to nowhere back in 2011. So they're supposedly for the follow-up period that you know, may never happen. So, just to recognize that a UN treaty, a UN organization, that we've, we've, we've put deaf people in that position, or non-position. Uh, uh, the delegates removed the article about contracts in earlier negotiations last year. So there's nothing that says what happens when there's a conflict between um, the provisions of the contract, the ability to enjoy the exception. Um, uh, People have talked here a little bit about this idea of how, how the copyright system would be changed by this. It's supposed to be changed in, in, in a couple of ways. It's supposed to really uh, make it so there's more cross-border exchanges of works done under exceptions. And it's supposed to be done in such a way that more countries have better exceptions for blind people. That's That should be the main point of the convention. It could probably have done that in one or two pages. And, had maybe a general clause, the, the one sentence general clause to deal with the broader copyright issues. It was when, uh, and I guess the version that was around in, in, in June of 2011 was about six pages long. It was a fairly short, short agreement. Uh, what, what makes it really grow up is, I mean, become complicated and, and, and larger is because people keep uh, wanting to fight about all kinds of things. If, if you take something like the three step test, you start mentioning the three-step test, the next thing you know, you've got four or five pages of bracketed text on the three-step test. I mean, I don't think there's much way around that, and I don't really see if there's much point. If it's really such an important part of the international system, you have a general clause that says that nothing that changes the international system, then why do you have several pages about uh, the three-step test and then kind of weird provisions, like you, you quote Article 10 of the, of the WCT, the part that the publishers like, and then you eliminate the footnote and the agreed upon statement on the very same article because the publishers don't like it. I mean, that's kind of weird to me. Or you 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 edit you edit the, the trips provision when you mention that, which is I think really strange. I mean, it's okay with us. We like the idea, as we mentioned many times, that you can amend the trips agreement in this treaty. We think that's a good precedent. <laughs> it just sort of surprised us, but uh, uh, I mean, apparently that's where the delegates are going on this. That's fine. Um, um, I don't think it's necessary to litigate every copyright issue in the planet on this thing. Um, uh, but if you raise a, if, if people start raising issues, then, then you have to do them. And the other thing is that if you think about something like fair use, <coughs> this is uh, from the United States Trade Representative in July of 2012. They said, uh, for the first time in a trade agreement, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, because they, they do talk, you know, it's, it's a longer paragraph, and it has, of course, a reference to the three-step test, but it, it says, and I think the important part is, it says, this will obligate parties to seek to achieve an appropriate balance in their copyright system, providing copyright limitations and exceptions for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. These principles are critical aspects of the U.S. copyright system, they appear in both our law and jurisprudence. 
And the balance side of it, and the USTPP proposal recognizes and promotes respect for the important interest of individuals, businesses, and institutions that rely upon appropriate exceptions and limitations in the TPP region. Well, why is that, that there? It's not there because blind people lobby to get that in there. It's there because uh, Google and Facebook lobby to get that in there. And so there it is. I mean, we have some big corporate interests that wanted something in the TPP. Uh, they wanted a protection of fair use because they do business and that makes some people wealthy and they pay money to shareholders. We've created a lot of billionaires in the United States around these provisions. And we've become a big exporter around the world and a powerful institution in these areas. And we're glad to see uh, you know, some discussion and disagreement on this area. Uh, here we're talking about blind people and everyone's like, oh man, you can't talk about uh, you know, fair use or you know, things like that. It, it's sort of uh, surprising to me. That, that people would really go, go after blind people on this. And particularly since they created kind of such a crazy, complicated way of delivering works to people. Everything has to be due through these authorized entities. And I live in the United States, I use all these exceptions. When I put something on Facebook, and, it, and it's a picture that somebody else took, and I don't ask permission, I, put it here and I share it with my couple hundred friends on Facebook. And, and there's advertisements from Facebook on that web page. Uh, or I put a New York Times article up there on my Facebook page or something like that. I don't really, is Facebook my authorized entity? I don't think so. I mean, I just do it. And, um, <laughs> didn't, you click the, I, didn't you click the I accept the authorization? Uh, what I'm saying is when I, con when I post someone else's content. So I think that you're creating a system for blind people that has this, this sort of uh, paternalistic authorized entity structure, and that's okay up to a point. But it doesn't cover all the things that you would do as an individual. You guys are served by more than just libraries or Lexus or something like that. You have a lot of other ways that you get information. Blind people are not that much different than you in that respect. And so they, they can't have everything narrowly defined to be only authorized entities. They have to have something that deals with the things that lie outside of that thing. I think your main thing is, are the exceptions used by people who are not beneficiaries? And I don't think they should be. I think that, that this is a special case for blind people and, and it should not be for me, it should be for them. If I use something that, you know, uh, it's infringing, I should have the entire weight of the entire actor reinforced copyright system come down my head. But, you know, they should, they're in this different regime. So this isn't the act of this treaty for blind people. I mean, just. Just if people are kind of focusing the exceptions uh, on the beneficiaries, I think that that's uh, the principal safeguard that the publishers have. And if they can come up with legal offers to compete with a handful of small nonprofit charities that they're worried about competing with, I think they'll do just fine. I think that uh, that the commercial book stores in the airport in my in my neighborhood uh, uh, and Amazon.com compete very uh, aggressively against the Arlington Public Library which I go into maybe once every four years uh, to check the book out on. And uh, uh, so I think, you know, that the nonprofit authorized entities that are providing works to, uh, to uh, blind people, I don't think that's going to be a threat to Random House or Pearson Publishing or anyone else at the end of the day. And uh, so I hope we can get this treaty done. I hope it can be a good, robust treaty. I hope the United States can do something about the deplorable fact that they can't even unlock the embedded text in the videos for this thing because the NPA has such a apparently massively like uh, political influence on the Obama administration that blind people getting access to PowerPoint text in an audiovisual thing is a big huge international problem that you can't overcome in this treaty and this UN body. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. Just to follow up on your last point on audio uh, visual works, how how could the uh, this treaty address the, for example, the continuing legal education or distance education where audio visual works may be used? Now the, the, the basic issue is the following: is that uh, when I went to school, the uh, the audiovisual guy was the sort of nerdish guy in the class that could make the projector run and figure out how to, you know, <laughs> deal with that. And uh, the younger people, the people that are, you know, old enough to be, you know, I mean, they're much younger than me, that's for sure. 
when they go to school, they walk into, in some classes, a, a fairly well-equipped classroom for audiovisual works, or they could be students in a developing country or around the world, or, or, or people getting continuing education. Um, where increasingly, uh, online videos are being used as part of the education curriculum. And in those videos, you'd have an audio track, like you'd have a, you know, a video of a professor speaking or something like that, or, or maybe somebody actually, sometimes it's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning kind of things, where somebody's explaining something, but there would then also be, um, for example, in the continuing education classes that Scott Labar takes, there might be a PowerPoint that has a, a text from a statute. I think anyone in, the, in this room, is, I think there's a lot of lawyers in this room, that's taken a, you know, one of those courses, has seen in the background. I know that, that Michael Shapiro himself makes these things. I've seen his. He's actually quite good. He, he explains copyright for the uh, copyright office, and I think you use you use text as well. It's not entirely just looking at Michael Shapiro 100 percent of the time. Sometimes Michael Shapiro is showing some like statute in the background or something like that. If you were blind, you could hear Michael Shapiro. If you're blind, you couldn't see him, but you could also not see. The things he puts up on the screen behind him in those uh, in those in those uh, distance education things, teaching people about the copyright law, and I think look, this isn't that big of a deal, and I just don't understand why people are acting like, oh man, I don't get it. I, why? How can we uh, how can we fix it? It, it? You know, people made it pretty clear. They're not asking for the video itself. They're not asking to see Ben Hur on the screen. What they're asking to do is to see when somebody puts up statistics, when they put up data, when they quote from something, if it's a literary course, if they put up a quotation from a poem or whatever the heck it is, that that itself can be made accessible. And, and you know, occasionally you could have descriptors of some of the things that maybe some other visuals, but, that, but, but I mean, the fact that it's, it, you know, this content exists in an audio issue, should it have its own sort of special exotic status, you know? Like a, a, so that somehow this like some like hands off. I'm sorry, blind people. Because you're blind, we have just decided that because we can see it because it's a visual thing, we actually don't want you to see it. In fact, we're making it part of the treaty that you actually will never have access to this because it's a forbidden fruit in the treaty. You know, I mean, like, what is that about? I mean, are you really that insensitive? Are you that unaware of where things are going in terms of the education system? The way they're going to make education available to, 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 to the global population in an expensive way is not going to be providing 30 students and a well-qualified teacher and a blackboard in the future. It's going to involve these kind of technologies, and you have to make that also available to people who are blind. Thank you. David, you, you mentioned the right of translation and called it affirmative action for blind people mm -hmm. in, in terms of this treaty, and I, you know, personally, I'm not sure that that's... I, that everyone shares that characterization. I don't know if Jamie or Marcus or anyone else on the panel have any responses to, to that. Yeah, I say I'm personally, just like for women or minority groups, I'm in favor of affirmative action. So why not for disabled people? I think there's a case to be made for uh, uh, differential rights for blind people in this area of, of translation rights. Uh, one of the speakers, I, I, one of the delegates I, I, I've heard seen, I don't think I, I get too much trouble by mentioning that he said that many people that are blind in developing countries are illiterate or have low levels of literacy. And uh, the, right of, uh, the ability to, to take a work that maybe somebody that had a higher level of education, make it, make it available to that person so that they can understand it, uh, would be beneficial to that person that's blind. And, I, you know, <laughs> I think it's kind of mean-spirited for the EU, where people are very wealthy, you know, compared to the rest of the world, uh, to be weighing in and trying to prevent people in Africa and Asia and other places like that are pushing for the translation right from uh, from being able to make works for blind people in those countries in, in, in languages that they can kind of understand. And, 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 and I think that it, it's empirically true but that population is a disadvantaged population. So I think differential treatment would be a good thing, personally.